Hey guys, welcome to Hillbilly Talk with Shane Simmons, back yet again with another episode. Hopefully today's topic's a little fun one for us all. I want to talk a little bit about dating in Appalachia. I think I've mentioned before on this series, I know I have elsewhere, that I interviewed about 100 people since we started the Appalachian Project, mostly elderly and kind of got their life story. One of the questions I always ask, because it's just something that always fascinated me, was how did people date in Appalachia back in the day? So what I found was not particularly riveting or exciting or shocking or anything else. It was actually exactly what you'd expect, you know, back in those days. So I talk a little bit about that and kind of what my experiences were and then what it's like today. Because it's a lot different, you know, if you're in an urban area or, you know, from elsewhere, outside of the mountains, it is, I'm sure, quite a bit of difference, I would think. Maybe not so much now, but we'll get into that. So when I first interviewed the first few people, I started sitting, getting a very common theme about the dating of yesteryear. So back in those days, a lot of times you would, they called it courting. You know, I'm sure you've heard that term if you're from around here, especially. So that court, the boy would take a liking to the girl. And next thing you know, they'd probably go to church together. They would sit next to each other at school or during lunch. They'd walk to school with each other. You know, they just made ways to have contact with each other. And the biggest issue they all had was the inter-family parental parts of it because you really wanted, especially as a guy, you want to make a good impression on the mother. So they always were very polite and very respectful. And usually where it's such a small town, you wanted a good reputation for yourself. So, you know, you kind of kept yourself above the fray on all that kind of stuff. Weren't as many lover boy types back then as there are these days. I think options were limited and people were satisfied a little bit easier than they are these days where you have so many options and so forth. So that was one of the the things. But, you know, some of the things they did, they went to the movies. They even would go bowling. A lot of these, even coal camps, had bowling alleys. And I was, you know, didn't realize that that was as big a deal but when you're in an area with very limited options, you know, any kind of entertainment stands out a lot. So, and even once, not in the early, early days, but probably 50s-ish, when people actually had vehicles and so forth, there would occasionally be a case where somebody would go on a car date, as they called it. That was basically the courting and how you pitched woo to your desired love. So it's courting and, you know, just a sweet, kind of just like you saw on the old 50s TV shows or the uh, even the happy days or whatever, where it was just in more innocent time at school, they'd have dances and so forth. Of course, you know, there were some boundaries there. There were, weren't kissing or any of that kind of stuff in public. So it's a lot more respectful and discreet and, you know, just formal until you got married. So that was kind of the way it was then. And I heard that story from... I would say 80%, maybe 90% of the people that told me about their love life history. So kind of just put that together with my own story because I come along in the 80s would have been when I would have started dating. And I got a funny story about that. It was, you know, we did a lot of things, going to the movies, of course, dances at school. Some of that stuff didn't change. Driving around, you know, you listening to music. And then by that time, the good old telephone had made its way into the equation. By the 80s, late 70s, I can't speak to the early 70s because I was, wasn't around then, but by late 70s, early 80s, and into the 90s, the telephone was your number one weapon of seduction. <laughs> you'd call and, man, you talk about nerve-wracking too. You'd have a crush on a girl and next thing you know, you'd have to call the house. And Man, you talk about scary. <clears throat> Let me just paint that picture for you. You're sitting there dialing those numbers and when you got to that last one, you knew 99% chance the girl ain't answering. It's going to be her dad or her mom. And I don't know which one's worse. They're both mm, scary prospects. I think, I think I was a little more scared of the dads just because of the male thing. They always, when they picked up, it was like, oh, gosh, I don't know what to do. And, and they were much, 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 much more likely to give you a hard time. Like they'd just test you or tease you or do whatever to try and... Uh, throw you off your game, so to speak. But it was uh, <laughs> these cowards today who can just send a text or uh, have social media, they don't 
know what they're missing when it comes to the fear of the dad. But boy, I tell you, I remember the very first time I did it, it was terrifying. Just, I mean, each digit, when I, I probably hung up, I, I think it was seven digits back. No, it was five. You could three, nine, my number growing up was three, nine, three, three, two. So you'd be like three, nine, three, three. And by the time I was about to push the two, I'd choke, hang the phone up. <laughs> it's like, Try to work your courage up, you know. Then you do go for it again. Three, nine, three, three. No, 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 no. I'm not ready, not ready. Give me. I'm afraid I'm going to, you know, I'm still, you can still have me breathing heavy, you know. And you had to work that courage up. And I don't know how many times it'd take me to five or six times. And then finally I'd just be mad at myself for being a coward. Be like, you, if you don't do it this time, you're not going to do it at all. We're just going to quit for the night. So I'd be like, three, nine, three, three, two. And then when that phone started ringing, it was like, oh, man. This goes scary. Ring. You're sitting there, and, you know, gosh, what am I going to say? If it's the dad, what am I going to say? If it's the mom, what am I going to say? You had all these things mapped out in your head. If, if it happened to be the girl, what would you say? And uh, especially if they weren't expecting you to call necessarily. Normally, you'd have to get the number from them, but sometimes you get it from a friend. They'd tell you to call her or whatever, and it'd be, ooh. So then it'd be like, hello. And you're like, uh, can I speak with Cindy Loop? You know, you'd just be nervous and try to sound nice and as likable as you possibly could. And then, you know, after that, all bets are off. It's like you didn't know what you are going to get. If the dad would tease you or sure or whatever they'd do for you, it'd be, it was, a, it was, it was tough times, man. These kids today don't, you don't have a clue of how thick-skinned you had to be back then to take that. I know some people probably didn't worry about it, but man, that stuff drove me bonkers. I do have a funny story, too. And, and during that time, there was a few more options. Of course, like I said before, we, you could go to somebody's house and watch TV together. You can go to the movies. You go driving around, but uh, dances at school, but also football games and so forth. That was a big place to meet people, and I had one of my worst experiences doing that. There was this girl I was interested in, and kind of mutually, our friends kind of set us up, and you know, I didn't know her from Adam really, but I knew she was pretty attractive and went to a different school, so you know, we went out. And the plan was we were going to go and split up. It was me and a buddy and then the, his girlfriend and this girl who happened to be his girlfriend's friend. And they were going to try to make everything happen. And then if all goes well, I would end up driving the friend home and hopefully sparks would fly. Well, so we went to this game and, you know, I don't remember a thing about it. I don't remember who we even played. But... On the way back, yeah, we, we things went well enough. We split up. The girl gets in the car with me. We're heading back, and we go to Dairy Queen. You know, that was one of the little side things to get more time together. Well, Dairy Queen had just rolled out this thing called the Blizzard back then, and it was amazing, I guess. But I'd never tried one, and I was dying to try it. So that very night, I had my first Blizzard, and I chose the creme de la creme steel, the top of the food chain, the cookie dough blizzard. And I had that, and me and the girl, I can't remember what she got, but you know, I'm sitting there and I got my little spoon in, took a bite, and just savored it, and I uttered words I'll regret for the rest of my life. I was like, God, I love this. And when I said that, I just could feel something. I could feel something out of her, so I turned aside, and she was like, I love you too. And I was like, I mean, I was just completely mortified and stunned, and I didn't know, I mean, I was like, oh my God, what, have, what has happened here? What have I done? And then, you know, I had this panic mode. I was like, what am I gonna do? And I hesitated. I waited just too long to take it back. So I was stuck with it. I had to go down with the ship. And I was like, oh my goodness, what have I done? Like, this girl thinks I told her I loved her on the first date. And I was like, oh my, and, but she liked it and she loves me back. It's like, oh, she was so excited. She, she basically floated home. I mean, there were tears in her eyes. Her face flushed. I mean, it was a nightmare for me. And it got back and I know she went home and told her mom, dad, and her fish and dog and all of her friends and everything else. It was like, and I was stuck with it. So I was like, man, I've told this girl I love her. I don't really like her even that great. After we went out, I was like, eh, well, she's, pretty, she's okay. But next thing you know, I was like, well, I'm committed now for a little while to always on my way out of this one. So, yeah, it was a bad day. That was a bad, bad day. And that's another one of the times I realized my low talking voice <laughs> came back to haunt me. It's like, oh man, I've got to project more. 
I've got to get that voice out. But that was misery. And so you go from that, uh, those times, the phone call was the worst. Then you move up here now to the social media days. And I see it some through my sons and some of the other kids that go along. And heck, I've been in a dating pool myself for that matter. And you move into the Facebook. And at first, it was, if you sent somebody a private message that you didn't know, that was kind of sort of courageous. And now, every Tom, Dick, and Harry goes in there and they slide in the DMs, is what they call it. And try to hit on everybody they talk to. And you end up having this big old mess because everybody... You know, I think that's why people aren't faithful as much as they used to be. One of the reasons, well, back in the day, they didn't have options. You know, you had just a very few limited options, limited access. And now you've got the world literally at your fingertips. And so you have all these options. You don't you have a backup plan and a backup plan for the backup plan and all that stuff. So it's like, eh, you know what, you take me off today. I think I'll go be with somebody else. I'm tired of this. I mean, that's just the way people operate anymore. And I don't... Uh, it's definitely not an improvement by any means, but it is what it is. And uh, so I think all the, my kids and everybody else, Snapchat, uh, texting, Facebook Messenger, TikTok. I mean, they got all kinds of ways of, you know, you send each other a funny meme. That's how you communicate and stay in each other's mind. In some reels funny videos that's kind of the way they communicate mostly even more so than at school and so forth like we used to you'd have to make time to you know but now it's a lot easier you can text somebody you love them at night and text them in the morning and uh, so it's a lot easier to just stay in contact with somebody which is cool uh, that's a good thing back in my day on top of everything else about the phone call how bad it was this was a bad situation too is that if you weren't you're calling somebody outside of your immediate town is long distance and you're talking about outrageous. It could cost, you know, that was real money back then too, like three or four or five dollars to call somebody if you talk too long. And you know, that's like 25 now. And it was just a nightmare if you made that mistake. And you know, you're talking to somebody, you wanna be cool. You don't wanna be a guy on there, well, I'm afraid of running mom and dad's phone bill up. So you'd sit there and just act like, oh, it's nothing. And, and, you know, well, let's just talk for a while. And then you just, you'd have all kinds of problems when that bill came in, trying to explain that to your parents especially things didn't go well in that relationship. So that is a little wrap on the Appalachian dating and people from not from here, I'd, I'd love to know what you guys did. If it's the same or different or how that dynamic worked elsewhere. But you know, well, like they always say, poor people have poor ways and that's what we had. We had some poor ways of communicating and wooing and whatever, but man, we've made it work anyway. So, all right guys, see you in the next video.